This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by American Helix. The American Helix is a revolutionary new concept in smoking technology. Designed and manufactured by American glassblowers, this pipe is light years ahead of its time. Based on Brunoli's principle, the shape of the pipe along with an innovative intake system creates a venturi effect through precision micro holes in the chamber, which results in a slower burn that conserves tobacco and gives a smooth, refreshing smoking experience, making the American Helix the smoothest hitting pipe on the market. For further info or to locate their products, you can find them online at AmericanHelix.com. That's AmericanHelix.com. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Glass Studios. Located in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida, Zen Glass has a wide range of offerings to choose from. Their menu includes one-on-one or group classes in their hot shop or flame working studio, create your own wine glass, and so much more. If you're a traveling artist, they even have a space to rent that you can temporarily call home. With over 50 years of combined experience, Zen Glass can help you fine-tune your techniques, whether you're a novice or advanced glass artist. For their calendar of events, including info about their third Thursday studio jams, you can contact Zen at zenglass.com. That's zenglass.com. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 146. This is Jay Michael, your host, and thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories in hopes to inspire and entertain, while helping you grow your business. And today is no exception. Today is going to be a best of featuring Steve Sizelove. Uh, this comes from episode uh, 9, I believe, and I also replayed this on episode 21. And with our growth of our audience, we have had exponentially over the last few months. Uh, I felt I wanted to get this out there. Steve is uh, one of my favorite artists in our industry, has been for a long, long time. And uh, he was uh, one of my first, I guess, uh, checklist kind of bucket list artists I wanted to bring on the show. And Steve t- shares a story, talks a lot about his uh, early beginnings in the fine arts and what... Uh, transitioned him from going from a pipe maker into the fine arts back into becoming a pipe maker. And as we all know, with the industry is changing and uh, what have you, uh, Steve claims that he was kind of late to the game, which I beg to differ. And as we all know, Steve uh, has his bubble trap technique, uh, which is uh, his style, his look. Uh, There's a lot of artists out there that are uh, emulating his work and trying to figure out the process and concepts. And it's a very old traditional technique, and Steve uh, talks about his process of, of learning this technique. And I'll tell you something that I learned from him, uh, a class I took, for those who have listened to this before or other episodes have heard me refer to a class I took with him in Coil. And uh, the class was a two-day, really intensive, and actually was the first class uh, myself personally had taken in just about 15 years, uh, besides my little apprenticeship that I started when I uh, first got going here. And the first thing that Steve showed us was his bubble trap technique. And it's one of those techniques that is deceptively simple. Uh, You see it done, you think, shit, I could do that. And then you go and try and do it, and you're like, holy shit balls, this is crazy. It's not that easy. A lot of steps involved, and timing, as with glass, is everything, especially when it comes to this technique. And Steve, uh, being the master that he is, has this technique down to a science. And his work just says and speaks volumes of it. Uh, Not only his shapes and designs and still going along with that sexy, sleek, Venetian look, uh, but to also be able to incorporate his bubble trap and as well as a fume tech and just all kind of fun stuff. And just he's an amazing artist. Uh, He's a family man, uh, husband, father, 
and just an overall badass uh, artist and human being. So I just felt like I needed to get this out there again. Uh, going to be bringing Steve back on the show for a follow-up as uh, we see where he is now, two years after we had this episode uh, first aired, which is crazy, almost two years that we've been on the air now. So awesome. Um, I wanted to also thank everybody who had responded and replied uh, to me from my last episode uh, that I posted uh, about my past struggles with anxiety and depression and uh, my kind of breaking point that I got to uh, in my life uh, a little bit over eight years ago and where I am now. And, you know, it's it's, it's not an, always a struggle as things are a lot different now, especially in a mental space for myself. But I know that on a daily basis that there are people that struggle with anxiety and depression and, and suffer from it. And I really feel like this is something that a uh, topic we need to continue talking about. And so I'm going to be continue talking about it. Uh, not only sharing my journeys and my struggles and my stories as well, but others uh, that come on the show. I'm going to be bringing on uh, some experts dealing with areas of ADHD and depression and anxiety, uh, fitness, how to overcome certain things, how to manage it. Because sometimes you can't just get over it. You've got to manage it. And uh, yeah, so I felt it was really important. But again, I, I am humbled and honored by everybody. I mean, I, the response was huge. It was way more than I was expecting. It was what I was kind of hoping in a sense, but it wasn't what, you know, it was more than I expected. So thank you for everybody who reached out and uh, downloaded the show and listened to it. Uh, I know it's not an easy listen, especially for those who have uh, been through the process yourself or personally witnessed a good friend or family member who has dealt with the same kind of thing. Um, or and he's even has gone through, has actually followed through with suicide. It's, just, it's crazy. But uh, to bring you on a higher note, I uh, want to let you know that Mountain Glass for the entire month of January, they have two sales going on. They have their 20% off Golden Gate tubing borosilicate sale. Uh, just go to, to mountainglass.com. When you go order your Golden Gate tubing, put in the code Golden Gate at checkout, G-O-L-D-E-N-G-A-T-E, all one word, to receive 20% off. And for all you soft glass nerds, they have their Efetre Moretti Murad 30% off sale. Just put in the code Efetre, that's E-F-F-E-T-R-E at checkout. And uh, they have all kind of new stuff coming in. They've got their new North Star uh, Absinthe and Maple Syrup rods, uh, Greasy Glass CFL rods and tube. They have new Double Helix rods, a new art, art contest, as well as a new Carlisle hand torch. And on the note of color, uh, there's some kind of some crazy controversy going on in our community right now and just in the glass world uh, with glass alchemy kind of going rogue in a sense uh, and deciding to uh, I, I, I'm not sure the whole story 100% uh, but they recently sent out emails uh, for all of us who receive emails from glass alchemy uh, talking about their new uh, membership that they have for glass artists they receive discounts but also like a coupon code club kind of deal and I'm not sure if they're going 100% direct to the artist now or if they're going to be still dealing with distributors. Um, but I do know that the process to update and create some of these new colors is really, really expensive. And on a business side, I completely understand where they're going to because of the cost that it takes to manufacture color, especially now with all the new laws and regulations from the EPA coming through. Um, and as we all know, like Abe over at Northstar uh, was one of the first to step up and is taking the bull by the horns in a sense and created an amazing facility, updated technology, you know, a lot of money invested uh, into this stuff to make sure their color is able to be processed and produced for us. Um, also, you know, the remanufacturing of certain colors to make sure that they're, you know, up, up to date, up to par with codes and, and EPA regulations. So I know that's all very expensive and they're small companies, you know, they're not like these multi gazillion dollar conglomerates like an Apple or something like that, that has all these huge million dollar gazillion dollar backers. So in a business sense, I understand. And I think what we all need to do is just kind of sit back and be patient um, and just kind of watch and see what happens, not really jump the gun and get all pissed off and start talking shit and, you know, blowing their doors down with pitchforks and torches and shit. Uh, whether it's a CC or a torch that's a piece of wood with some twine on the end of it that you dipped in kerosene. <laughs> but that being said, um, I think, you know, just kind of on the same note, you know, with our political state here in, this, in America right now and everything else, it's, it's so easy to overreact or to react. And instead of us reacting, uh, we all have our own personal 
you know, things we're dealing dealing with business life orders, having fun, all that stuff. And I think if we just sit back and just focus on those areas of our life and not really focus on what these other companies out there are doing, uh, just see what happens. Um, it's going to speak volumes. I think, I think the, the public is going to really help steer where the direction of this industry is going in a good way or a bad way. I don't really know. I'm really curious myself to see, especially with social media. Um, you know, I see the trend even more so with the direct artists to the customer where the, sm the smoke shops are getting left out. Um, some smoke shops are not even dealing with our artists anymore that deal with straightly to the public. You know, there's kind of some kind of on both ends of the spectrum. There's a lot of, a lot of not bridges being burnt per se, but just kind of some, I don't know, weird vibes and animosity uh, going around. So I think if, you know, again, if we all just sit back, just stay to ourselves, just keep doing what you're doing, making your glass, ordering your colors, ordering your materials, you know, supporting your, your distributors like mountain glass. Um, and if it gets to a point to where some color is only available through distributors, that's how it's going to be. If some color is only available through the companies that manufacture it, that's how it's going to be. Um, I think in order for us to be able to afford to buy some of this color, especially when colored, you know, like I know I saw Abe and uh, posted in Torch Talk uh, how he's talking about he's got his Abe, Abe Vault, you know, Abe's Vault color line that are more or less an exclusive line of color that they can't manufacture a shit ton of it because if they did, they would have to charge 120 to $300 a pound. Um, it might get to a point to where they need to do that just to kind of bust the bubble per se in the color. I don't really know. Like I said, I'm just kind of talking out my ass right now, thinking here with you guys because I've been watching this from a distance and also I've you know expressed my opinion on here uh, about Glass Alchemy specifically just because of some of the goings-ons when they'll do a sale uh, or like they have their Valentine's sale coming up soon and they don't necessarily, they, they limit how much you can buy, say if you go to Champs and they have a booth and they have certain colors that are really, you know, releasing, but they also have that same color online and to be able to have an artist to stand in line and at Champs and buy the color and while they're in line, they're on the phone with their friends or whoever, or even on their phone themselves, just ordering it online also and double, double dipping per se. So maybe Glass Alchemy's way of doing this membership thing is going to help them regulate how much color and who's getting what, where, when, and why. Um, or maybe not. Maybe someone can come in there and buy 100 fucking pounds of you know whatever, and then the color's all sold out. So who knows? Like I said, let's just all sit back and not get our panties in a bunch and just sit back and just see what happens. Continue to do your thing. Um, you know, If you're going to become exclusive to, say, North Star because you don't like how Glass Alchemy is practicing their business, you know, that's all you, again, we're as individual artists, our voice, our pocketbook per se is going to be what's really tells the industry and moves the industry in a direction. So enough of my rant there. Just wanted to get, to get that out there. Something I've been thinking about, um, lots of trade shows coming up and going on right now, big and champs and age and the, uh, glass Vegas is going down here soon. Uh, down here in Florida, we have, from what I've seen, the first actual show being put on by the collectors. Uh, it's called the 1K Show, where everything in the show is going to be uh, no less than a thousand bucks, which is pretty cool. Pretty cool concept of a show. Uh, my boys over at Zen Glass just had uh, Kaj Beck in town doing an amazing Millie class, a three-day intensive class with him. And the work that I saw and this, the inspiration I've been seeing now in the studio where everybody is like, like Josh, who's one of the co-owners of Zen, came in late last night at 11 o'clock uh, after his family was in bed just because he had this million in his head, he had this eyeball he wanted to get going and start. Just super cool. Love, love seeing the new inspiration when some, someone takes a class or somebody new walks through and comes in and just opens up the mind of everybody. And Kaj is a very interesting cat. Um, I would definitely want to bring him on the show and have a, actually a, a good friend of mine who uh, personally knows him. So we're going to try to see if we can have a one-on-one -on -one sit down here uh, in the next couple of months or maybe even before that. So either way, uh, we have some amazing artists coming on here uh, interview wise this last week uh, over at Main Street. I'm not, for, for those that follow me on Instagram, saw probably my, a lot of my posts. Uh, every couple of years or every year we rebuild the furnace. We have a hot shop in the back of our store at Magic Kingdom. And uh, this week was rebuild. So we spent three overnight shifts uh, basically rebuilding the furnace. And the three of us uh, had never done it individually on our own. It was the first time really that we took 
this and and I did it on our own uh, as quote unquote experts. <laughs> so, and myself personally, I only, I, you know, I only have like maybe maybe fifty to maybe seventy five hours in a hot shop, hands on wise. Uh, zero experience building a furnace, much less building kilns. So it was a really cool learning experience to go through the process of breaking down and rebuilding. And it's an it's an electric furnace also to kind of clarify that. So it's a little different than a, a built in uh, gas powered furnace, old school. But nonetheless, uh, definitely kick my ass, especially doing the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. shift or whatever we did. You know, there's three different nights, and we can't do it during the daytime because uh, the way Disney is, is all their work and construction and building is all done after the park closes, after they drop that curtain, uh, in a sense, and stage is closed and everybody goes home. And then the crew comes out. And it was neat to see the behind the scenes and the cleaning process and, you know, the whole idea that uh, every day when you go to Disney, it is if the park just opened for the first time. And it's, it's an amazing idea and business model and concept, especially because they have guests every day, thousands and thousands of guests that have never been there before, and they want that experience to be fresh every single time. So it was pretty cool to see the process. But that being said, it's why I have not put out any episodes, didn't do any recordings. I put all my uh, interviews on hold uh, until next week. Uh, but I do have a, a lot of an amazing... Uh, we got Malachias coming on. We've got Micro coming on. Uh, just to name two of the many that were coming on. i um, going to be bringing Luke Zimmerman, the lawyer, back on. We're going to be talking about some some up-to-date uh, laws and things going on in the industry, uh, talking about the FTA rules that just passed recently for the e-cigarettes and the vape tobacco crap and what they were trying to do to uh, potentially regulate pipes and what have you. And then now with the new inauguration, which is actually happening today, uh, we shall see what happens when it comes to cannabis laws and according to our here now uh, president-elect, soon to be president, whenever you listen to this, uh, Mr. 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 Donald Trump here, uh, we are going to see what happens. Uh, I know his stance through the campaign was that he's going to let the states do their thing, uh, but his uh, little attorney general he brought in is, uh, from what I like to say, is a cocksucker and isn't really a fan of uh, the cannabis industry. So we will see what happens because we all know when we had a uh, cocksucker in the office as attorney general, what happened last time. So let's all uh, pray to whatever God, uh, deity, uh, loaf of bread, whatever it is that you talk to at night and uh, ask for uh, protection and a forward movement in this country as uh, you know, the president elect comes in. It's going to be very interesting. So that being said, I got 10 minutes to get the fuck out of here, take a shower, get dressed, and hit the road. So I am not late to work. Enough rambling. Love you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And thank you again for all the feedback and response from the last episode. I do greatly appreciate it. Uh, it, it, it was not easy to do. Uh, it gives me the courage to continue these conversations and to get more and more transparent with y'all. Uh, I'm going to be getting into money issues that I have in terms of uh, financial budgeting, uh, this year really for me is all about practicing what I preach uh, as a dad, as a husband, as a business owner, as a host of the show, uh, someone that people look up to in a sense for uh, our industry and the responses I'm getting. So, uh, you know, we all have our struggles. We all have, you know, whatever we go through and uh, getting into routines and habits and stuff, which is what I'm doing. And y'all are coming along with the ride as I'm going along with your ride. So thank you again for tuning in to episode 146 featuring the best of Steve Sizelove. You all will enjoy this if you have not heard it yet. If you have already heard this one, this is still an oldie but goodie. Steve's a badass. Go check out Steve Sizelove on Instagram. Just go into the search. Just look up Steve Sizelove. He'll come up. He's also on Facebook all over the world in glass. Google him and uh, look for his video. I'm actually going to put a link in the show notes but he was on uh home and garden channel many moons ago uh, for a modern master show where he uh, had the crew come into his studio and showed them how to make a venetian goblet when it was like 25 degrees outside and uh it's, it's pretty funny to see it see see what steve looked like before the beard and uh yeah there you go <laughs> i'm out of here uh love you take care Peace.
Uh, Steve Size Love, how are you, my brother? I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? Pretty good, man. A little groggy and tired, but other than that, man, loving life. Can't complain. Nice. So just kind of a background of my perspective on your work, man. You've been a major influence in my glass uh, pretty much through my whole career. I started back in 99 and I uh, first seen your work in like glass line and on some you know major publications and the internet and it's like who the hell is this guy and this is even before I knew anything about your functional work and just your you know your goblet making stuff and uh, so I was always really inspired by your Venetian style glass the colors the brightness of it the symmetry like everything man like always was very sexy to me and so that being said like what was it that initially introduced you into the glass to the flame and then where did that style come from? Well, first, let me say thanks for your kind words um, yeah, and for having me uh, here and chatting about this glass stuff with you today. Hell yeah. It's um, so I'm an art school dropout. I moved out to Colorado, and my neighbors were in the beginning stages of learning some flame working, and they needed some help getting oxygen and things like that, and I helped them out. And then when they started getting good enough that they were selling pieces, uh, they were making pipes in a little metal shed next to their trailer at 30th and Valmont um, in Boulder. It's kind of a crazy little uh, ramshackle little situation with uh, three of us sharing a national. Wow. But, uh, yeah, they started getting good enough to sell some pieces. And as a thank you for helping them out and, also knowing that I was an art school dropout and that maybe I'd be able to have some skill with it, they gave me the chance to learn. And, yeah, we shared a national for a few months, and then we shared um, then we shared a minor burner for a little while. Altogether, we were about three months in this little metal shed next to the trailer. And then we rented a space in the North Boulder Warehouses, and we were really reluctant to, uh, to rent a space. Uh, that was back before... Any functional work was widely available. I mean, you couldn't even find it in in shops. It was pretty much just yeah. dirty tour kids uh, that were coming through that had pieces. Um, so we were we were really kind of sketched out about the whole idea of uh, renting a space and being that high profile to be making pieces. Yeah. But anyways, we did, and there was no big deal to it. Um, then we. Uh, all three of us together formed Diablo Glass, and we really kind of pushed that hard in Boulder uh, through the 90s. And then in 99, I decided that doing a lot of production and managing a shop with, at that point, we had like 10 people working for us. Wow. And uh, that was really kind of distracting me from making good work and uh, just the whole party culture of Boulder in the 90s and managing a shop made me realize that if I wanted to get serious about my glass that I needed to go do something different. So, so yeah, then that's when I moved uh, back to the Midwest uh, with the expectations of going to the Appalachian Center for Craft and studying offhand glass blowing. Okay. Uh, but I really didn't have my act together and didn't really plan well. And next thing I knew, I was around the Midwest for a little bit longer than I had expected. And I had a small studio set up in my garage and then met my wife and had babies. And now I'm still here in Indiana. <laughs> um, and in the middle of all of that, from the beginning until where I am now, I, let's see, well, I took some classes from some folks. Uh, from Kevin O'Grady and Roger Paramore and Robert Mickelson and Lucio Babaco and Mylon Townsend and oh, yeah. uh, have had the good fortune to befriend a number of more established glass artists um, at the time, like the artists from the 90s era. And uh, that really pushed my desire to make good work. Yeah, man, I can see that. Your, I can see that in your work for sure. Like the, just the quality and the craftsmanship, especially those names taking classes from those kind of guys. You know, it's like the whole that whole circle of five concept that your your influences in your life and who you are generally are the people that surround you. You know, and to take classes from those guys, especially at that age, to seek out that knowledge at that young age is 
it's amazing. It's awesome. Well, uh, we were really lucky. The three of us um, were lucky that being in Boulder, Glasscraft was nearby. Okay. And we befriended the folks at Glasscraft, and they were really one of the only places around at that time having classes even. Huh. So I really feel like me and Glass uh, has been – it's been a lot of really good fortune and a, and a lot of good luck in regards to all of that coming into my life right. uh, and and making something out of it. Um, I mean, as an art school dropout, I never knew if I was going to do any work again. Never really knew, I don't know, what, what my creative focus was. And, um, yeah, and Glass became that for me. And having the opportunity to study with uh, those kinds of artists and, and have them as an inspiration, um, I feel really fortunate for. Yeah, it's awesome. I know like myself too, like I, in terms of my background education wise, I never accomplished a degree. Well, I shouldn't say that. I got my EMT certification. I was going to go do the whole firefighter paramedic thing until I was diagnosed with hypertension and blah, blah, blah. My doctor's like, yeah, that'll kill you. So I decided in your sense too, to seek out art classes at the college level, you know, to just better myself. Cause I've always wanted to be a professional artist. And like you're saying, you know, I've tinkered with painting and drawing and shit. And for whatever reason, man, the glass is my medium. You know, it's just a, such a, it's such a weird ingrained in my soul. Almost like it was what I was supposed to be doing. Once I first turned the torch on, it's very weird. That's awesome. You know, it's really strange. That, that's, that's a good feeling for sure. Yeah, because I mean, you know, like, there's a lot of cats out there that I see that can't draw a stick figure to save their life, but then you see them create some stuff out of glass that comes out of their head, and it's like, holy fuck, like, where'd, where'd that come from? You know, it's really strange. What, I think one of the things about glass for some people is the technical process of it. Mm -hmm. So you can be creative, but you can also follow a, a technical process or a formula. So people that that have kind of different creative skill sets can find find the process as um, I'm not going to say a crutch, but as a, uh, a as a point to begin the creative process or to begin the the, the work of layering on the creative ideas. Right. It's almost like engineering because, like, I wanted to get into architecture and engineering. I've always been fascinated with just building design and how they came together. So for me, the glass is not only art, but there's science, there's engineering, there's architecture. You know, there's this whole left and right side of the brain kind of merging together for this giant creativity type thing, you know? Totally. It's pretty cool. Especially you look at, like, you know, Buck and Banjo, like those cats, what they're doing. You know, it's like taking small pieces of glass and making this incredible, gigantic feat, you know, whatever. They're, I mean, it's just, I can't even talk about it sometimes. It's just mind-blowing, you know? You know, I, flame working is pretty um, unique uh, to glass, or, or or unique in process. How you can create these very organic shapes and then uh, combine them into much larger elements. I remember the class that I took with Roger Paramore at Glasscraft. This was probably back in '97. He was uh, going on an excited tangent about that whole idea about the possibility of scale by building many components and then because flame working in borosilicate especially is so forgiving that you could assemble things to a scale with with boron flame work that you couldn't ever dream of in the hot shop yeah exactly just by the, the component uh, aspect of it yeah and now yeah. what's funny is i mean as much as i appreciate that my own personal uh, aesthetic isn't one that likes a lot of busy uh, components all put together. Mm -hmm. I like really clean lines and simple forms. But Yeah, same here. But I, it doesn't yeah. really keep me from appreciating that other stuff either. Yeah, exactly. And, th and th honestly, that's what's turned me on with your work is that whole symmetrical streamline, you know, very sexy. I mean, like the, the female figure in general is like the greatest thing ever designed. And your work has that same kind of curvy... You know, it kind of emulates the look of, like I said, your glass. To me, your glass is very sexy. Um, even your functional work you're getting into, you know, like, you know, I guess kind of to go into that, like, at what point did you find, because even though you were doing the functional stuff from the beginning, 
at what point did you say your kind of click of taking this style that you learned from these masters with your Venetian style kind of look and then transition that into into the functional side? Oh man, well how would I, how would I say all that happened? Well, I kind of rambled on in the beginning about you know, about my start and this and that, and I guess that's just a function of having a conversation Mm -hmm. over the phone knowing that it'll be broadcast to people. (laughs) So with with the the most realness in all this, like, I I started doing pipes, not knowing if I was ever going to do art or whatever, or not really knowing what good art was, and all of those, um, or, or, or good art in glass. Mm-hmm. And then all of those artists that I took classes from, and, and those are the things that I, I saw around me that, that were held up by these people, by, by the establishment as the, uh, the examples of the finest work out there. So I wanted to work in that direction. And, and going to art school, I, I kind of came to the glass from, well, glass wasn't my only thing, wasn't my only foray into art. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I was drawn to the idea of doing all this other artistic stuff by seeing all this other work. And I put all of my effort into trying to transition from pipes into the art stuff. And, you know, and that's why I left Colorado too. Like I wanted to go be an artist. I didn't want to just stay at that point, like a pipe maker, right. somebody that was in a shop managing like, a bunch of people that were working like strippers. They needed, they did work hard when they needed the money and, and like all of that whole lifestyle. I mean, it was fun. I had a hell of a lot of fun, but I felt like I wasn't really focusing on being a good, make, making good work. Right, right. So, so I left and that's when I went to, uh, back to the Midwest and then I'm married and I have a baby and operation pipe dreams happens. Mm-hmm. And I was still making pipes at that point, really starting to, like, try to be serious about making art. But then that was like a catalyst for me where um, the Midwest is kind of conservative and, well, not kind of, it's very conservative. And I was just like, fuck, man, I can't really, like, live making making pipes and and living, uh, I don't know. Uh, I like, mean, Not living paranoid? What, what, <laughs> Well, yeah. but how do I how do I explain it? Like I I, I didn't want to live a risky lifestyle mm-hmm. in 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 a situation that would endanger my family. Right. Absolutely. Um, I mean that's really what it's all about. And so that was the 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 catalyst for me to really try to put my foot into making art and. I don't know really how the the Venetian kind of thing developed, except for my technical appreciation of the glass, like from way back, always led me to be fascinated by things that I couldn't comprehend the complexity of uh, in, in, in the process. And so even though it's not my personal aesthetic, like I'm not really drawn to frilly, ornate stuff, I absolutely loved the challenge of making uh, of making that kind of complex work. But it was the technical that drove me into doing the uh, Venetian stuff. I, I really had an interest in the way the human form is a really organic but technically driven pursuit could go with really clean lines of, of vessels and stuff. I, there, there was something about the process. But the jumping off points for creative exploration, both of the form and the poses of the figure that um that, that drew me in mm-hmm. um and and I had some i'd say I had some success with that or or at least like the work was pretty well received as it became more and more refined mm-hmm. and so I was stoked on that Hell yeah. it didn't make me a damn bit of money though in the long run right. I mean really. While I was doing all of this, trying to really do what I thought was the right way to go being a glass artist in a way, like I I wasn't like down on pipers or anything, uh, but I wasn't, uh, I wasn't embracing the community. I was really trying to like shoot for 
an audience that was like the high end galleries and the museums and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And at some point, um, I, I was really struggling with doing um, trying to trying to keep it together to do shows, uh, at different gallery shows, and make any money on that because all of it is consignment based stuff. And the economy was faltering really badly, and nothing was making any money. And I was in the car on my way over to a glass art group meeting in uh, from a local glass art group. And I get there, and this particular collection, and this this particular collector lived in a what seemed like a gated community within a gated community. Crazy. And there were a bunch of other glass blowers there that were all there to like look at the fancy art, and it was basically everybody was like sucking this guy's dick to try to, you know, seem fancy and like their shit was worth anything. Mm-hmm. And I just realized that that was just all a bunch of bullshit. Um, yeah. And the uh, the work that they had there, I mean, it was all fine, but it was the who's who of the eighties, and. I just realized that, you know, if I wanted to keep making glass, I needed to, I needed to make glass that I identified more with. While all of the other stuff, well, I let let me go back up to. Not only did I need to make glass that I needed to, that I identified with, but I needed glass to serve my purposes. Um, and at that point, I had really developed an aesthetic that I enjoyed and I liked and I felt really good about, but I was done with it. And I was done trying to uh, work with galleries and, you know, try to keep a current resume and all that stuff. And, and the whole time I was doing all that, I was really kind of missing the vitality, the growing vitality in the pipe world. And some of the people that, I mean, I had taught classes to and had definitely considered peers that, uh, really held tight to the, to the functional game. They were having a blast. They were making good work. Their work had matured and had a, had an aesthetic that, that was pleasing and interesting and complex. And they had a vital community that was appreciating their work. And I just realized that I needed to start, uh, not, not like glumming, glumming on to be part of it, but man, that that was, that was my peers. Those were the people that I started working with. Those were the people that, that I still identified with. And so I went back to making, making pieces. I still did it kind of underground for a couple of years, but then I got a lathe and um, really kind of went full bore into stuff once I got the lathe. Hell yeah! I got a lathe for I got a lathe for free from uh, the local college, oh, and wow. it was like a gift that um, I can't even really describe how much it reinvigorated my love for glass by having the opportunity to learn something new. And then to bring it all full circle, then that's when I kind of realized that my love of form and shape and like just the, the, the silhouettes of the glass, all of that idea about the way I, the way I visually construct pieces was completely transferable into the lace. So now, even though some of the stuff I do is kind of scientific looking, I don't really even see it. In that way, I see it more as the bottles and the vessels that I was doing back in the mid two thousands uh, just changed up a little bit. It's weird, yeah. no, but I, I'm I really enjoying the work. Yeah, bro, I agree. I, I that's that's why you know I remember when you first came on Instagram and I was like, oh shit, Steve Sizeloff has an Instagram. And then I was like, "Oh shit, he's making some amazing pipes!" Like I was completely blown away because I had, I, I honestly, I, now that I'm getting to know you better through you know the classes and what have you, like you just said Diablo glass. Like I remember Diablo glass. I remember the frick. I can see the catalog cover in my head with the big, you know, devil guy on the front. You know, and 
knowing your background now through that, and then it's come. I mean, it, it's for me too. It's kind of weird, but being a fanboy in a sense of your work, it's making a full circle for me now with seeing where you come from and where you are now. Because when I saw your Instagram and I started seeing what you were putting and what you're making on there, it made total sense to me, dude. Like it was like he is in where he needs to be, and it's also nice, like you're saying too, with with social media. The way laws are changing, the way our industry is moving forward, the whole nine yards, there's such a vast appreciation. I mean, fuck, bro. I never even in a million years thought I'd be doing a podcast on glass blowing. You know, I've always want, I've, I've always been a teacher, but, you know, because of the way things are going, I felt like I felt drawn like I had to do this show because people are looking for this type of stuff. And to be able to, you know, like yourself, expose your work to other people out there that have no idea who you are. It's such a huge opportunity for myself, but for you and for everybody else out there. So backing up a little bit to social media, when you first came out, I was like, this is fucking amazing. And then to see the comments and the likes and then the more appreciation for people are like, who the hell is this guy? And then they start going back and looking at your old work, you know, which is kind of fun, too. You know, so, for instance, when we were taking that class, they were bringing up the whole uh, HDTV, That's Clever show you did. And, I, you know, <laughs> it's hilarious, bro. But it was like... You gave the 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 country an introduction into what stick stacks and shit that you know was. I remember doing that stuff. You know, getting so frustrated because my rubber bands or something was popping off and my rods would fall everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, but seeing you do this on TV and then seeing like I just watched this before we got on the phone, and you know I hadn't seen it before. But the piece broke on you, which is awesome. I even told you in the class we took, you're making that female figure, that bubble trap female figure, and it cracked. And I thanked you. I mean, it was kind of a shitty thing to say, but I was glad that that happened because it gave myself a perspective that I've been doing this for 16 years. My shit breaks all the time, and so does yours. So it's just part of the game. It's just, you know, it's the way the shit is. The people out there don't see what goes on behind the scenes that this may have had a crack in it and we fixed it. You have no idea. But the fact coming from an artist who I fine tune my craft and I love what I do to see you, who's been an influence and an inspiration of my work, going through the same struggles is pretty badass, you know? So kind of to transition forward a little bit, now that you've gotten your style and your look, what was it that started the whole bubble trap concept and that whole technique? Okay, well, I was uh, teaching class at Halo Glass in Fort Collins, Colorado. It was probably 2007, um, maybe 2008. I'd have to go back and look. But anyway, <laughs> uh, Brad Wilson, that that uh, has that shop that had me out there. He uh, does a lot of galaxy pattern stuff, uh, but he also, I don't know where he got the screen, and I don't know who gave him the the heads up on the whole process, but he did some bubble trap stuff and showed it to me, and he mixed it with uh, the galaxy pattern, and I didn't, um, it was cool, but it wasn't, uh, it didn't look like it was refined all the way, but it had a lot of potential, and he gave me a piece of the, the stainless steel screen that I use as my mold for the core of my bubble trap. Mm -hmm. um, and I took it home and started playing with it and kind of developed that pattern. I mean, it took me a while to get it down. Like, the first preps were pretty small. And, um, yeah, there was a lot of trial and error. But um, I was really looking for a pattern that was unique and didn't look like everything else out there. That's part of what drove me away from pipes for a while mm -hmm. was that all the colors were the same. All the patterns were wigwags. Everything was like a Sherlock kettle bub. I mean, yeah. everything had a horn on it. I mean, everything everything looked the same for a while. I mean, and that's not entirely true. Um, but I know you're saying but, that. I, I, mean, I agree. And so I felt like with the amount of work, and this was in the, the mid-2000s and, and earlier, the amount of work that people were putting into their glass and for the amount of, I mean, it's not about the money, but for the amount of pay that, that people were getting for the amount of work that they put into stuff, I mean, you could work for a whole week on a piece and have pounds of color in it and maybe sell it for a thousand dollars. Now my point with that is if you do all the math, you're basically with overhead and all that, you're working like minimum wage. Yeah. So the part of the drive for me was to find a pattern that 
that was unique and fresh and, and that I could do in a way that, uh, that was sustainable. I mean, some, yeah. And so, yeah, so I was, I was kind of, uh, driven, not driven, but I mean, I was kind of uninterested in the pipe thing for a while. So that's part of why I did the art stuff. But then when I came back to doing pipes, I didn't want to be in a situation of spending so much time doing work that looked like all the shit everybody else did. Yeah. So when I found the bubble trap, um, or when I was introduced to it, like I said, it was a bit of an evolution, probably about a six month of evolution of messing around with it, but I saw the promise in it and what it gave me, and um, and I kind of ran with it, did my best to develop it. Um, and I'm, I'm still working on it, too, because fuming is one of those things that and you can always learn more about fuming. Mm-hmm. And um, and then the combinations of, well, there, there's just so much to do with it. Um, and the cool thing about the bubble trap uh, for me is that the fuming gives such a range of color that it works so well with accent colors. And it's um, with, with almost all accent colors. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. Like, uh, so, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's my bubble trap scene. Hell yeah, bro. Yeah, man, when like I took that class with you with you and Coil and you know that we you know, you guys asked, What do you guys want to learn? And we all said bubble trap. And that was the first thing that you showed us, dude. And I mean I literally threw my hands up in there and I was like, That that right there just paid for my entire class. That one just you showing us how you did that, bro. I was like, Holy shit, that is fucking amazing. It's so simple, but dude, I have fucking I have done it several times and it is not easy. Like you're saying, like even you're still fine tuning it. You know, it's I like the idea of taking techniques that I learned from other artists and then making my own perspective on it. I'm not going to do like I will not make a Steve Size Love bubble trap looking piece ever. But I take the technique and I do other things with it and try to experiment. Even like different like I've gotten some different types of screens I've been trying to use to play with the different traps and you know different fuming and you know it's it's, it's such a neat concept. But for me also it's very traditional in the old Venetian style looks of like the old, you know, Raticellos and stuff with doing the bubble traps and that. So for me, it goes back to 300 year old techniques that were all being influenced on a daily basis. It's like seeing Jason Lee now, the getting into the, the Millies and stuff and his work, you know, it's, it's neat to see the guys that have transitioned through the past 15, 20 years of our industry that are now really focusing on the tradition of what we do. Uh, that being a glass artist, not just a pipe maker, not just, a goblet maker, but an overall aesthetic line of work as a glass artist. And part of my show is to influence the new guys out there and gals that are making pipes. Because for me, and I'm sure yourself too, you learned a lot of your glass by making pipes. It really taught you the medium. But not get stuck in the niche of just being a pipe maker. It's good money. It can be great money. But you need to learn the medium. So that way, you know, Joe Blow McGillicuddy can make whatever the hell they want to make, technically, in a sense, you know? Oh, Totally. Well, and I, man, and that's to, to like understand where I am with things. That's part of why I was, why I felt so estranged from the pipe world for a long time. I mean, and I'm so glad it's different now. It's mm-hmm. so like I feel, I feel like I've come back to the pipe world, um, in, in, into a, a refreshed place of being, but in, into a refreshed pipe world, into a refreshed me. But for so long, pipers were only interested in pipe stuff. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and in the old days, when we didn't have the internet, we had to look to the other shit that was out there. And that's when we saw all this other stuff, and there wasn't very much out there, or nothing out there that really held up flame working. Yep. And so when the, the internet grew and flame workers were uh, able to kind of feed off of each other, it kind of became an insular community for a little while, um, which did a lot to really further that that community feeling and that that idea of movement. Mm -hmm. But for a while, that community wasn't really engaging with the history of flame working and with glass or art in general. But I'd say within the last five, six, seven years, the level of maturity in the work, uh, I mean, a, like a broad-based maturity in work, has mm-hmm. increased uh, both visually and the way that I think people are approaching things and the things that inform their work. Like like you said, Jason Lee doing all the Murini 
and, and like doing it fucking exceptionally well. And yeah. you can't do that shit without uh, really going in and understanding, geeking out on the history of it. I mean, yeah. that's not just like a cursory level, like I'm going to just piddle around with this. That's like full on geek kind of shit. Yeah. In a good way. Oh, yeah. That's, that, that's, that's, I think, the whole glass geek concept is what's fun with our industry. Not only the artists are like geeking out on this stuff. Not everybody, but the majority of us that, that are passionate about this. But so are the clientele out there, the, the people that buy our stuff. You know, it's so much fun to see. I mean, it's, it's silly at times, but it's fun to look through social media and see people just having a fucking blast with their glass. Like, you know, they got rooms that are dedicated to their art that they've been collecting. And you see kids out there that totally. have hundreds of thousands of dollars of collections. I mean, it's fucking mind-blowing sometimes. But it's so And it's funny awesome. to think that... that- some of them probably started too. Now, now all, even all the collectors are really knowledgeable about the, the material. Mm-hmm. They probably started off with going to a shop and, and getting sold a triple blown piece at some point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, I want to eradicate that term. That's my, my very first episode, I said we have got to stop the double blown, triple blown bullshit. We got to get rid of it <laughs> somehow. Oh, it, it's funny. I mean, who knows where that came from? Um, I mean, in. And what kind of dumb shit sticks, too. I mean, we still have a little bit of that. Yeah. I mean, you know, fads are fads, and, and terminology is determined by, I don't know, by, by the fads and all that. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know. But it, it's such a neat time to be making glass. I mean, there's there's market vitality in it, and I won't lie, that that vitality creates a level of energy that in so many ways is positive because people are able to to uh, live good lives and and in doing that they're able to really focus their excitement in and energy into the material when artists are and, and you know I guess I heard the term uh thriving artist instead of striving art or thriving artist instead of starving artist recently mm-hmm. and and I thought that was great because starving artists, I mean, you know, that's that's that kind of stereotype of, of the, the the struggle, like the like that creates real shit, that struggle. But sometimes the struggle drives people down. Yeah. And, and I mean and really can break people's soul. But when there is a thriving market with what we do then people are able to take their energy and their excitement and, and focus it in, back into the work instead of, I don't know, instead of, uh, like, desperate needs to, to pay their rent. I mean, so instead of people knocking out $105 spoons, they can take the time to really work on the work. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, it's nothing worse than sitting behind your torch sweating and stressing about whether or not you can pay your rent. It's not yeah, fun. and or then it's not good work that's getting made. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, because I really feel like our energy, in a spiritual sense, like if you want to call it that, really goes into our work. You know, there's been times where I've been in a shitty mood, and I'm working on some glass, and the shit cracks. You know, because my... Oh, we had that shit happen just the other day in our shop. Yeah, I, had a, I had a guy that was um, uh, a, a collector of my pieces that didn't like uh, the way a piece functioned, and... Man, I tried so hard to uh, make it all good with him. Offered uh, to take the piece back, give him his money back, and it just felt like he wanted to yell at me. Hmm. Um, but you know, man, everybody needs to get their shit out. Everybody needs to be heard. Mm-hmm. I mean, I didn't want to be yelled at, but I mean, this guy paid good money for a piece, so I let him yell at me. But the negativity, in turn, <laughs> broke a bunch of shit in the shop that day. Like not just me, I was like all stressed out, and then. My assistant was all stressed out, and he broke some shit. And yeah, you got to bust yeah. out. The yeah, that shit's contagious. Yeah, it, it totally is, bro. You got to bust out the sage and cleanse the room. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's what, maybe that's why I need a smudge stick. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm actually going to get some get for back this. Back to the, the wook roots. Yeah, brother. I'm telling you. <laughs> you know, as, as high tech as we all are, we got to go back to them roots. It definitely makes a difference. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to kind of also continue moving forward. Uh, I'm very curious with the ferrofluid that you, when you got into that, what was, was it your children's? Cause I remember we kind of talked about it a little bit, but to the audience, you know, what was the inspiration for the, uh, the ferrofluid in your glass? The ferrofluid? Yeah. Uh, that is a collaboration with Jeff Blaze. 
And I can't really take a lot of credit for that. I mean, that's really kind of his thing. It works really well with the bubble trap. Mm -hmm. Um, But, um, yeah, he is shop mates to Purdy, and I was doing a mail collab with Purdy, and and Purdy said, hey, uh, Blaze would really love to make a ferrofluid piece with some of your prep. And I said, well, sweet, I'm... uh, I've seen him on his Instagram. They they look pretty sweet, and uh, he he's busted out a few of them now that were fucking awesome. Yeah. Uh, from what I know about the Ferro Fluid is that uh, it was originally developed for the uh, space industry, and it's to draw. It's it, being a magnetic fluid. It is to draw uh, rocket fuel to a pump in zero gravity. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah. Huh. So now, at what point did Blaze? At what point was he like, "Hey, I'm gonna put some ferro fluid in glass"? I mean, I don't. I honestly don't know the whole uh, history behind that. So, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to defer that one to Jeff Blaze. Yeah, man. I will get a hold of his ass and find out because I'm curious. It's like the dichroic glass. Like you know, that's you know, background of NASA technology and whatever else that they use on the face shields for astronauts. You know, and here we are. Using it in our glass. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty badass. So a little business talk, if you don't mind. I'm just kind of curious, like, in terms of, like, when you sell your work, um, do you have a distributor you sell to? Or you, do you strictly just, you know, sell your works yourself to shops, to retail, to private owners, and then trade shows? Like, how do you go about uh, distributing your work? Well, it, it's constantly changing based on my needs and based on the, the situation as it presents itself. Okay. Um, back when I decided to say, fuck you, to working with galleries, um, I, needed, uh, I needed steady cash. I mean, I really, like, I, I went into debt to make glass. Um, and it was really kind of a bad thing in some ways for my family. Um, so when it was like, okay, glass, if I'm going to keep doing this, yeah, obviously it's got to be fulfilling to me, this and that, but it has to be a job. And so to make that happen, I, uh, I worked with a couple of distributors and sold hand pieces until I really like built that up. Um, and then I was able to start working with stores because I mean I had stores like ages ago that I worked with, but I mean doing art stuff I really like didn't keep any of those contacts uh, active, so I had to rebuild a whole customer base. Right. So after working with this distributor, um, I built up stores that I worked with that did not work with the distributor. I mean that was one of the things that was really important to me not to piss where I was eating. Mm-hmm. Um, so after that got built up pretty well, and at the same time, the distributors that I, w- I worked with, they were going through transitions. So it became kind of a natural transition. It wasn't any, like, one day, like, I'm not ever working with you or any bullshit like that. But just I transitioned out of working with the distributors and started working more with the shop um, and taking wholesale orders. And then I got the lathe. And started. That's when I uh, went back on the inst- well, went back on the Facebook and went on the Instagram and built all of that stuff up uh, just by posting a lot. Um, that let me get more stores, and I took more orders than I did Glassroots last year. That was actually the first trade show I ever did with uh, Functional Work. Huh. Um, so I did that. Took more orders. And kept taking orders and uh, took orders through March of this year. And I just got to the point where I was having an absolute hellish time uh, accurately gauging the amount of time that it was going to take to fill orders. And I got myself into situations where um, I had taken orders and I didn't really want to do the pieces after I'd taken the order. Um, so I was working on some other stuff. I mean, not necessarily the best business practices. So what I'm saying with that is I realized, like, I was busy enough that I was not going to be giving people good customer service if I continued to take orders. So in March, I stopped taking orders, and uh, I 
uh, and working through the, the orders that I have had, um, almost done with those. And then my intentions are to continue to work with wholesale people. Uh, but what I'm looking forward to doing is making up small groups and just getting with the stores that I work with that I've developed a pretty good working relationship with and saying, hey, this is what I have available. Um, if you want it, sweet. And I also hope to have the time to build up uh, – decent bodies of work to take to uh, more shows. Uh, traveling's kind of hard for me and my family. I mean, I love to travel, but it's I uh, got three kids, and yeah. uh, my son just started junior high. Uh, my wife uh, is now working at home with me at the business, and it's just hard to get away. I mean, you know, like, like grown-up shit takes a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know how many more shows I'm going to do, but that's where my business is now. It's I, I do a little bit of retail through the internet, um, but I mostly work with wholesalers. I try to very much respect that uh, that relationship that I have with the stores. So if I do any retail work off of uh, Instagram, I always make sure to price it at retail prices. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, it doesn't do any good to to go and undercut the people that that buy my work regularly, the the stores. Yeah, I agree. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I am with that now. I have uh, two guys that are my assistants. Uh, one of them's been with me for five years. The other guy's been with me for four years. They all did their own work. Well, I trained them from the beginning, but they both did their own pieces up until about the last year. And then we basically realized that we had the opportunity for – a better working relationship if if they were helping me to do my pieces. So I touch everything that comes out of my shop, mm-hmm. um, and, and most everything. Well, yeah, I, sh- I mean, I make everything, uh, I, I shape everything, but they're they're getting pretty damn good at doing prep work for me. Yeah, so what that has allowed me to do is really focus on the parts of the glass that that are new and exciting to me. Different configurations of uh, of ways to put things together, different shapes. Um, I'm able to go a lot more, uh, I don't know, I'm able to go more heavy because they're doing the work that would take up a shitload of my time. And in turn, I do my best to pay them pretty well for that because they are helping me to make work that that has been the most popular work that I have ever made, like as far as a, a commercial or market-based kind of thing. Yeah, that's important. That's where I'm at the same point because I've done the same thing myself rather in the past. Like before Operation Pipe Dreams, had a studio, had eight guys working for us, had online catalogs, like the whole nine yards. And it was just like you're saying, it kind of it gets to that burnout point where you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. This is bullshit. But now I'm re like I got my gig at Disney and I've been there for three and a half years and now that I'm seasonal I'm able to really refocus on me and my glass but I've brought in a new assistant on for exactly that to help me with the the paperwork the errands then will then eventually transition to him into on the torch doing prep work and stuff which is going to save me a shitload of time because every every point that I pull or every time I rip a tube in half I'm like oh my god I'm wasting my time I've done this a hundred thousand fucking times I'm I got to get someone to help me do this and it's you sh- people out there that are new shouldn't just jump into that. They, they need to go through the process of making 50000 whatever. And then you get to a point where you bring an assistant on. Like you said, it's, you've had yours now for four or five years now. So it's you're at that level where you can bring somebody on, and you need to, and you should at the same time. Yeah, That's important. Because like you're saying, you can focus on the art. You're not focusing on what? prep. And, and, you know, um, I think it was a hard thing to get to that point to – a couple things to get to a couple of people that were competent mm-hmm. that that I felt could do the work. Um, and man, I live in a place where there are not a lot of young freewheeling people that have a lot of time on their hands. So both of the guys that are working for me uh, needed real jobs, and they took some big sacrifices in not making shit for money when they first started. Um, because I couldn't pay him much. Right. So, I mean, there aren't very many people that can take on that kind of risk. They yeah. can be like, you know, uh, I'm not making shit for money, but I'll, I'll do it. Um, so, but to get to the point where 
I felt comfortable enough with their competency to really include it in my work. I mean, like I said, it was really four years of the one dude working, uh, making his own pieces and helping me with some prep before I really felt like I could really use it in my own work. Mm -hmm. Um, and now he kind of, they both are extensions of my hands because I, I, I mean, we're in the shop next to each other, like, you know, 30 hours a week. Yeah. Uh, and I work out of a one car attached garage to my house. I mean, we got three of us, two lathes and then a, a phantom uh, bench station set up in a 200 square foot garage. <laughs> Sounds like my space minus the lathe. <laughs> it's tight. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, it works though. But uh, I, what I was going to say about that, though, is since since I got to the point where I felt comfortable about what they were making for me, then I had to go to the point of, like, man, how much of this is really my glass? And you know what? I realized it really is all my glass because, like I said, I am I am shaping everything. I'm, I'm finishing everything off. Mm-hmm. And then I realized that, I mean, you know, that's kind of – the tradition in art in general. Not too long ago, they had a, a, a segment on NPR about art forgers, and then there was another thing about I forget what the, how the two came together. But anyways, they uh, they were talking about the history of students in studios in, in painting and the history of of how the students and the apprentices in the traditional painting studios would help prep, prep the master's work. They would prep the canvases yep. and, 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 you know, mix the paints and all of that. And I kind of realized that without intention, um, my studio and my business model has begun to emulate uh, traditions of the past. Yeah, that's awesome. And that made me feel, uh, that made me feel a little better about what we were doing. Because sometimes uh, I feel like things have got a little too commercial, but you know. But at the same time, like like I said before, that gives me a level of energy and vitality that I have not had with the work in a long time. I mean, I've gone through those births and deaths with glass probably like three different times. I mean. Mm-hmm. A lot, a lot of, a lot of lifetimes and changes. <laughs> I, I enjoy glass more now than I have in a long time because of being willing to take risks and and let things change. Um, and when I've learned recently that, in addition to just having people help me by working as a team and meeting the needs of the two guys that I have helping me then all of a sudden there's a synergy in the shop where where we're working together for a common goal. Yeah. And that's pretty fucking awesome. Yeah, that that yeah. all of a sudden makes it about something more than just me and my glass. It, it becomes about, um, man, being part of something that's alive. Yeah, it's true, dude. I agree in the whole team. But also what's fun, too, like on the, on the, on the I guess the... I don't want to say financial side. I don't know really how to explain it, but the fact that you're able to help these guys live their lives, you're able to support them, you're able to pay them a money, a pay whatever, that they can pay their bills, and they're happy. You know, you're, you're because of your work and your struggles and what you've gone through. Now you're at a point where you can help these cats out. That may or may not a job creator. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hell yeah. I joke about that, but sometimes I'm like, holy shit, that's true, and it's fucking awesome. Yeah, it is. Absolutely, man. It's amazing. And these guys, are, they may or may not go through the struggles that we've all gone through because they have you and you know, as their, their master, per se. You know, it's, it's, uh, they're, they're very fortunate. I would love to sit in your shop for five years and learn from you, bro. <laughs> That'd be fucking oh, amazing. Oh, man. You'll hear me bitch and whine about a lot of things, so I don't know. Hey, dude, I bitch and whine all the time, bro. We'll do it together. It's all good. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, I appreciate the opportunity to share all this with people. I mean, I uh, I don't know. I don't know if it helps anybody to talk about what I've done and not done, but, I mean, you know, it's fun to, to talk about, like, all of the change that I've seen and I don't know, but the inspiration of my glass and all that stuff is, I mean, that's kind of cool and all. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but it's the journey. I don't know. I, I guess I, like from, from my years of, 
of taking shit too seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, I try not to take shit too seriously now. And so it's in the beginning of this conversation. It seemed like, I don't know, maybe, uh, not planned, but, you know, awkward. It's because I've had these conversations about the beginning of my glass with people before and stuff like that. And, and sometimes you don't really know what to include for people. But, man, my point with rambling on again is that it's just nice to be able to share the love and excitement of glass with you, with the other people that are listening. And, um, and I feel fortunate because, like I said, I've had – you know, a good up and down, like probably three different times, at least in my 20 years. I've been doing this shit for 20 years this year. Wow. That's and awesome. so for me to still be doing it, I'm like, wow, man, I'm so fucking, uh, man, I'm so blessed. Yeah, it's true, brother. I, I count my blessings every day. The fact that I can get up and come out of my studio and turn on my kiln on. And I mean, I literally, bro, I'm lean. I'm, I usually work in my underwear. I mean, that's all I usually ever wear. You know? <laughs> Well, you live in Florida, dude. Yeah. It's like, I mean, you're you're making butt soup all day long. Yeah, man. If they can make a Kevlar sock of some sort, I'd wear that bitch all day long. You know, <laughs> protect my nuts while I'm working. Just wear that <laughs> red oh, hot, yeah. red hot chili pepper style. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, uh, so kind of just one more real quick question before we go into uh, thanking our sponsors. Uh, you mentioned that your wife now has kind of come on board with the business. So, is she the one that helps? the money side of things so that you're not worrying about the, the financial stress and the the books. She is, uh, she's not super stoked about like being my secretary, mm-hmm. but, um, and I'm, I've told her time and time again, you're not my secretary. You're, you, you have hugely helped me make more glass by helping stay on top of this stuff. Cause what I realized is like all that shit, it's about, it's about half, I mean, you can split up your time about half office clerical shit, you know, bookkeeping and all that stuff. Um, split your time up half with that and half with glass. Yeah. But because she's doing that for me, I'm able to get so much more glass made. Yeah, it's true. The reality of having somebody competent um, and organized that you trust handling your business shit, that, that is... I mean, without a doubt, that's worth that. That's worth whatever you can pay for it. Yeah. Um, and usually, you get what you pay for too. The mm-hmm. less you pay somebody, the less you get. Yeah, exactly. It's also the whole trust thing. I've heard horror stories of businesses, you know, having people laundering, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars outside the back door that they had no idea was going on because they're not they're not running their that side of the business. So it's definitely it's important. The trust. God, I don't ever want to be at that point where where I am so out of touch with uh, things that, that that would happen to me. Yeah. But if I'm, that, if I'm that, uh, I'm getting that much money, well, then I mean, may, maybe it's a different story then because <laughs> I'm definitely not making that. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, man. Well, let's take a quick pause real quick to thank our sponsors, and we'll come right back. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is sponsored by Wise Guy Media a new company dedicated to showcasing the talents and offerings of their customers through podcasting, eye-catching graphics, logo, and customized web design. Established in 2015, Wise Guy Media is continuing to push the elements of web and logo design with outside-of-the-box ideas and up-to-date graphic-generating programs. Whether you want to launch your own podcast, need a website, or a new logo for your brand, they have all your needs covered to promote yourself and get your brand recognized in your industry. To see what they've been up to, check out their site, www.sonyourmedia.com forward slash wise guy for a sample of what they've been doing to help get this podcast off the ground. That's www.sonyourmedia.com forward slash wise guy. Now it is time for the most exciting part of the show. It is time for the lightning round. And the lightning round consists of a couple of questions, five or six questions here, and uh, each answer can be anywhere from 30 to 60 seconds long. And if you want to expound upon the answer a little bit longer, that is fine too. But uh, yeah, man. Here we go. So, okay. First question is, if you could work with any living glass artist that you haven't worked with before, who is it and why? Skip. I'm going to skip that one. Okay. Yeah, so I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay. 
Yeah, it's it's a, that's why I want to ask it because it's I'm not looking at like pulling any name out of a hat, but I'm just curious, you know, because there's a there's a lot of amazing artists out there. I could list 50 people right now. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. That's why it's so hard to uh, to say who I'd want to work with. Yeah. I mean, you know, do you want to work with somebody because you'd go have a lot of fun with them? Or do you want to go work with somebody because you'd make some really badass glass? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go work with them because it's an opportunity to go to a different part of the country that you don't get to go to? Uh, do you want to work with them because you want to maximize the amount of money you can make for the amount of time that you're going to be working? I mean, to answer that question is so hard because there are so many different reasons to go work with people. Yep. That's why I ask it. I mean, is that a fair answer? Dude, that's perfect. I mean, that's not a yeah. lightning round answer, but... <laughs> hey, it's an answer. It's good. So, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, number two, if you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, what is it and what, and why? Uh, it's the sound of non-attachment. Cool. <laughs> because when... When I hear glass break, I have practiced many times to not care because I don't want to continually uh, be pained by by things that I hold dear breaking. Mm -hmm. Understood. It's, it's a practice in Buddhist non-attachment. Hell yeah. <laughs> what are your top five favorite colors? Green. Green. Uh, green. And lavender, and purple lollipop. Green. <laughs> well, I mean, not really gl green glass. Uh, there aren't really any good transparent greens. There, I don't really like most of the greens in glass, but I like green a lot in the real world. Yeah, me too. Hell yeah, especially in glass. Part of what sucks about living in Indiana, it's so gray and brown during the winter. Yeah, I could imagine. I can, I've, I've only seen snow once in my life, dude, in almost 40 years. So, I'm not really familiar. <laughs> but I've seen pictures. I mean, snow's okay. It's just, you know, like, you know, six months of shitty weather. That, that sucks. Yeah, it does. So, uh, what's the worst injury you've ever had as a glass artist? Worst injury? Um, I've had a couple pretty bad burns. Yeah, hand and torch kind of stuff, or just grabbing hot glass? Uh, both. Yeah. Grabbing hot glass, hot tools. I've got a nice scar on my thumb from uh, my little torch. I have a magnet on my little torch, and when I was working one day, I uh, just set it down on the bed of the lathe um, because I needed to do something. I just went to pick it back up. or No, I hit the, uh, the hose with my foot. And the little torch just swiveled, like pivoted where it was uh, stuck to the bed with the magnet, and just went right across my thumb. Mm. And that was a that was a pretty bad burn. Mm. That sucks. So, if you could give your beginning glass blowing self any advice, what would it be? Oh man, quit smoking cigarettes. Beautiful. Are you a TV, a music, or both in the studio? Uh, music or NPR. Okay. Or or just silent sometimes too. Yeah. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, two two uh, interviews ago was with Kemp Curtis, and uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kemp, but he's been behind the torch for 46 years, and I'm not. A I want to check him out. Yeah, bro. The guy's a wealth of knowledge, but he's uh, only has 10% hearing. So when he goes in the studio, he just pulls his, his hearing aids out, and it's just him and the flame. It's a pretty interesting concept. Yeah. I wonder if he's uh, uh, hearing losses due to uh, years of loud torch action. Nope. He was actually born that way. Him and his sister both were born that way. And uh, he, grew huh. up, he grew up in the theater, so he learned how to hear more or less from reading lips in the theater. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an incredible story. And besides the the, the amount of background we talked about in History of Glass, and it was it was pretty cool. So, uh, all right, man. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was episode 17, but. All right, man. So the last and final question is a bit of a crazy one, but uh, I've added one more little doozy to this guy to make this a little bit easier to answer. But uh, the question is, if you were stranded on an island that had a glass studio in it, and only supplied your torch, gases, and a kiln, what five items would you bring? Oh, let's 
see. I, I like my lathe a whole lot. I need a paddle. Um, probably some tweezers. Uh, and if I'm on my lathe, I need a good uh, octagonal reamer. How many? How many things is that? I think that was four. That was four. So I need one more. Oh, I need my glasses. Amen. You're the first person to give me that answer, dude. Hell yeah. I was hoping out of anybody you'd give me that answer. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those are the, you know, they're, they're kind of like, you don't think about them because they're on your face. You don't really see them. So, yeah. But, yeah, you can't do shit without them. Yep, exactly. And finally, uh, before we say goodbye, if you could give us how we can get in touch with you through social medias and websites, and also if you can give any uh, parting piece of advice. Uh, let's see. I am on Instagram at Steve underscore size love. Um, I'm almost also on Facebook, but pretty much Instagram is like the best way to go about it. Uh, and then kick me at Steve size love, like all one word. Um, I don't generally answer email these days. I mean, not that I'm opposed to it. I just don't really do a very good job of juggling all that shit. And then parting words of advice, man, uh, do your best, know what, know what the best is and do your best and don't take any of it too seriously. Don't, don't ever think that you know all the answers and yeah, just, I don't know. Don't take this shit too seriously. Hell yeah. I agree. Well, hell yeah, man. It has been an honor and a privilege to get on here and talk glass with you, brother. It's been a lot of fun. It's uh, an honor to me that you would uh, want to listen to me babble on about all this random kind of stuff. But <laughs> um, I appreciate the opportunity, um, and I hope I hope the best for your glass and for everybody that's listening, too. Hell yeah, man. And I had to get my ass out of Indiana to come play with you for a little bit. Awesome. Welcome anytime. Yeah, dude. I appreciate that, brother. And uh, go plug your phone in, and we will talk soon. Yeah, awesome. Let me know when this is up uh, and uh, listenable so yeah. I can make sure to avoid it. Because <laughs> usually when I hear this kind of shit, I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> you, you know how that goes. Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't mind listening to yourself. Otherwise, doing the podcast would be kind of rough for you. I don't know. Yeah, you know what? The very first episode I ever did, I went back and listened to it. And because I had never really listened to myself talk before like this, it was like listening to another podcast. And it was, I liked that that was how it was because it made me realize that I was doing an okay job at this because this is all new for me. Nice. So. Yeah, that if you can uh, have that level of um, kind of just observation about it, that's great. Hell yeah, yeah, dude. And if and just well, I, I, yeah, see, I was just gonna say thanks again. I thought uh, yeah, that yeah, uh, we've had a wonderful conversation, and dude, you're welcome here anytime, man. Awesome. Not dude. that Indiana is a, a good place to visit, but hey, it's the home of Steve Sizelove, brother. I'll be out there. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, happy melting, and we will be in touch. Awesome. Thank you very much, Jason. Take right, care, man. Yeah, man. Take it easy. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Glass Roots Art Show. Now entering its ninth year, Glass Roots is designed for artists and distributors who wish to do wholesale business with shops and galleries. Located at the Monona Terrace Convention Center on beautiful Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, the art show features at least 25 glass workers demonstrating and creating pieces for public viewing, live and silent auctions, raffles, and approximately 40 booths consisting of raw material supplies, functional and non-functional art, and glass charitable organizations. This year, in 2017, Glass Roots will be held October 9th through the 11th. And for any more information, just go to glassrootsartshow.com. That's glassrootsartshow.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make the flow the leading international lampworking journal. 
For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.